Or... Okay, we start the recording. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Shriram Kalki, and today we'll be going over the number theory, uh, first uh, lecture of the Alps number theory lecture series. Well, first off, what is number theory? Number theory is the study of integers and uh, the functions. It's one of the most beautiful subjects in the mathematics. As you can see, you already heard of it, but one example of this that there are many mathematicians around the world trying to find the largest prime number using computer technologies and uh, many software programs. Like we don't know yet for sure if there's going to be an infinite number, well, there's going to be an infinite number of primes, but we need to know that how many of them are there and um, um, we need to know one of how big they are. As you can see, they are pretty, one of the largest primes are the, like um, at least 100 digits uh, long. So that's just an example of seeing how big those numbers and how fascinating number theory is. Then you also hear of stuff like the Fibonacci series, which is, um, which is basically like, let's see. Hold on, I need to put my pen. Okay, zero, one, one. Two, three. There are many amazing things in nature, like you know, real life, and with this pattern by itself. Well, let's not take too long on that, and you can always admire number TD anytime. We first explore to this week, we are learning time factorization and divisibility, which provides uh, the basis for GCD, greatest uh, common denominator, and LCM, least common multiple. Well, I'm assuming you all have heard of these at least once in your school manual curriculum, but um, we're going really deep into this. This is a competition math, and uh, yeah, usually competition math is much harder than school math because you, you won't be just given a problem saying, um, find GCD of 728. Yet to, uh, the problem makes it much harder to make you do much more steps. So this course will help you on the AMC and AME. You all have heard of that at least once. So basically the AMC 10 is the first test you take. Uh, and then if you qualify by doing really good on this, which is not easy and it'll be a good achievement if we get we into AME. And then the AME is a second test. Finally, we'll see some base numbers and Diophantine equations later in the course. It won't be as popular as um, than what we're learning now, but you'll still encounter them many times in AMC and AME. Okay, without further ado, let's go to some basic terms and notation. While you have heard most of these, it's best to refresh your memory on them. So a natural number is prime if it can't be expressed as a product of two smaller natural numbers. First of all, natural number is like zero, one, two dot 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 so on okay so an example of the prime number as in other words it's only factors of one and a number itself so for example let's take the number five for instance what are its factors one and five can is five divisible by two uh, no it's not because you'll get 2.5 which is not a natural number and then we can also take three and four and we'll see it, it's not divisible so then it's only one and five. So that means it's a prime because it's only factors on one and the number itself. Next, uh, we'll see composite. Composite is basically about every other number, not including zero. By the way, zero is neither prime nor composite. So it's a, a good thing to remember that as in many plots, you might overcount by one and then that's plot wrong by not knowing that zero is neither prime or composite. A composite number is basically about the opposite of the prime number. This uh, a composite number has multiple factors than one and itself. So let's take the number six. As always, it has one and six, but this time when you divide by two, you get three. So two and three go together. So that means two and three are other factors of six. So that means there's multiple factors. Now yeah, let's see. One, two, three, four and five are not. Four and five are not the uh, factors of six. So you can see when you divide, you won't get a you won't get a natural number. 
So we have one, two, three, and four, mm, four factors, four factors. A prime number only has two factors, one and five, and this has four, so tau four, six is composite. Next, a multiple of a number is a num is that when you multiply a number by integer, that means it's divisible. I don't think I said it right, so yeah, it's best to learn by example. Okay, let's take the number seven. Okay, and then we'll say that not that if we do seven times two, we get 14. We want to see why 14 is a multiple of seven. Well, 14 is a multiple of seven because it contains the number and a different number, or it could be even one. But I'll see though, it could be one, and then seven is a multiple of itself, so is 14. And then you can keep on going down the times table. 21 is a multiple of seven. So basically, well, a multiple of a number is basically a number when divided, when divided by another number, it, it results in a natural number. For example, 2107 is three. And then factor is kind of the opposite of that, like multiplication and division. 21, seven is a factor. So we can say, we can say a factor of 21 is seven because seven times three is 21. And then finally, you may have not heard about this much, but this is called co-prime. Two integers are, two integers, oh, sorry. Two integers are co-prime of only the positive number that is divisor of both of them is one. In other words, in other words, we'll take the numbers five and seven. You can say that these are co-prime because the factors of one and five for this, the factors of seven is one and seven, and it needs to have a different number of the, and only one source twice. It needs to have a different number than one that is common. And since five is not equal to seven and there's no other factors of five and seven, that means that these two numbers are co-prime. Usually you'll also hear the same word. This is a synonym. It's relatively prime. So relatively prime and co-prime are used interchangeably and they, the, they mean the same thing. Finally, right? this is what you rarely hear in school math. You never, you probably won't see this notation in school math much, unless in the, unless you, unless in the higher school curriculum, like um, college uh, curriculum, you'll always see it like that. So we write M, and we use this, which is basically, uh, I'll call it, um, I'll say, I'll call it a ball. Um, M ball N means if M is divides N. So, okay. and then we'll also use M ball strike. I'll say um, when M does not divide N. If you don't understand what uh, this means, that's okay. We can also, this will make it more clear. So basically you can write, if M is divisible by, if M bar N is true, then we can say, then N is equal to A M for some integer A, okay? So um, an example of that is seven, bar 21. This is basically saying 21, I mean the seven divides 21, as I said here. Well, without further ado, let's go to, let's go to the next section. Next, we have prime factorization. You probably heard this in around sixth grade, but this is basically the root, I, call, I like to call it the roots of the numbers. We have to check. Okay. So we forgot to mention that uh, Justin and Chirag are the TAs for the lecture today. So you can DM them on Zoom chat. You can see DM those co-hosts and then they'll be able to answer your question. Okay. 
Then um, the prime factorization of a number is a representation of n as a product of not necessarily distinct primes written as n. Oh, this is really hard. Uh, this looks really confusing at first, but I, I promise I'll make it more clear. So n is equal to p sub one to the power of e sub one, p sub two to the power of e sub two. By the way, these are subscripts. So they're basically numbers that go under under a number. So we don't have to go like a to the power of e one b to the e two, and this makes it a little bit easier to read. And it will go all the way to p sub k to e sub k. And what is p sub i? Well, p sub i is the i prime. So like p sub one is the first prime, p sub two is the second, and so on. And then e sub i is the power, which is the which is how much time? So P1 times P1, P1, E1 times basically. So, so EI, E1 is the power of P1, E2 is the power of P2 and so on. And then N is equal to this. This implies that all integers come. Well, these are primes of course. So this means that all integers can be broken down into the prime counterparts, this, this, so on. So let's do an example of this, right? Because I don't think much of you will understand how this is and we'll do better with a, with a real number. So let's go to, um, let's do 42 actually. 42 is divisible by two, 42 is divisible by one. We know it's also divisible by three. And it's also divided by six, but we need to see how many powers. So it's also divisible. It's not divisible by four though. So we know that two times 21 equals 42, right? And what can 22, 21 be broken down into? That's like three and seven. So two times three times seven is equal to 42. So 42 is uh, n. And then we can also write two as this, but the power is one because two to the power of one, anything to the power of one is obviously going to be the same number in the packets. Then three to the power of one, seven to the power of one. Okay, 42 is n, p1 is two, e1 is one, p2 is three, e2 is one, and then p3 is seven, and e3, e2, e3 is one, sorry. Okay. So that means this is an example. Let's do another one because I don't think uh, I don't think forty two was the best example because the pearls are only one. Okay, let's do um. How about twenty four? Okay, twenty four is equal to two times twelve, and then twelve can be broken into two times six. So two times two times six. And two and two are prime, so we can't take that down further without using ones. And ones are ones as the one is not prime. I've got to say this: one is not prime, and it's also not composite either. So it's one and zero, zero and one is not prime and not composite. With that down, we will continue. Um, six is broken down to two and three. And then we have two, three times. So we have like two, three times three. And then three, one, of course. So then we can use the same example. N is 24, P1 is two, P2 is three. Then E1, which is the power of P1, is three. And then E2, which is the power of P2, is one. So we down, note that these two are the, its counterparts, two and three. I think you all understand it better now. So we will continue to 2.1. Now we'll teach you how to find, um, how to find if a number is prime and how, how to find the devices of it. So usually um, when you have a number, sorry, when you have a number, um, you see go from, Two, you check two, it works. You check three, it works. Four, 
and then dot 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 and you check up to 23 that's what most uh, that's what many students do actually but this is uh, suboptimal let's go what if we had 2486 check two it works actually it doesn't work that's a device we do we'll say for later and then we'll keep we'll keep having to go to 2000 or oh, to 24,085, which is, as you said, it's going to be too much. It's going, and especially when you're in the middle of a contest, you can't do this, you won't have enough time. So then first of all, there'll be some device wheel rules we'll go to about in the next week. But for now, let's act like we don't know those device wheel, device ability rules. And let's see how to make this process shorter. So we already have a first simplification. We already know that we can check all the numbers under to 24,086 or any number n from two to n minus one to see if they divide p. But this is still tedious, as I said. So then finally, we had to uh, finally we can do some algebra. Note that we have a number k, and let's say that k times p by k. If k is divisible by p, then P over K is divisible by P as well. Here's my, here's the proof for one. So since K is divisible by P, P is equal to, well, more P is equal to K times another integer A. And what is A? We're going to divide every, the whole thing by K and we get P over K, okay? So that means P over K times K uh, here, 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 K times K is P. So that means TAFO, if you use the converse of this, then we'll let, then we'll let P over K is divisible by P. Okay. Anyways, now that knowing that, and also let's assume for now that P is not a perfect square. And then we'll say what happens when P is. If P is not a perfect square, then root P, then uh, root P um, will be, root P will be less than K. And we can also assume that, we can also say that it's greater than P over K. Okay. We can also say the reverse of K, we can also say if K is less than P over K, but then you'll just have to flip these two. In other words, um, we know that k is greater than the square root of p, which is the whole number itself, and which is greater than p over k as well. And then we can also use, say that, so for example, two times three, two times three is six. Six is, okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, two times three is six, then we'll that, and then the square root of p, we can say it's between two and three because two squared is four, three squared is nine. And then to be approximate, we can say it's like 2.4 to 2.5. Uh, then, uh, then we'll say k can be three and then p is six, six over three is equal to two. So three is greater than root six, greater than root two. What does this mean? Then, um, if p over k is prime, then if, since p over k is two, that means p is composite because of p of, because when you multiply two times k, k is three, and we know that six is composite. So let's uh, let's try this out. This this was just an example, and then for square root uh, like twenty five, we can say that five, twenty five, and one are the factors. And we can say that we can, and then if there is, um, if it is square, then we'll just have to use greater than equal signs. That's why we had to sort them out. And that greater than equal signs, you, you probably already know them, which is basically that k can be equal to square root of p, and it can it can also be greater than square root of p. So a final simplification. We don't know how else to simplify it with other than using divisibility rules. So instead of checking all the primes from two to p minus one, we only have to check from two to the ceiling of square root of p. Yeah, so these notations, 
are, are called ceiling are called ceiling functions. And then for example, if you have 5.5, the ceiling function takes the number that's greater than greater than this, that's the least integer greater than this number in it. And then the least integer greater than 5.5 is 6. 7.5, the least integer greater than 7.5 is 8. So for example, if we have root 6, which is, then we have to check all the primes from 2 to 3, because the ceiling of root 6, which is around 2 but less than 3, is 3. So then let's try finding all the primes of 24. Okay. 24 square root of 24 is about 5. So we have to check all the primes less than 5 or equal to 5. 2, 3, and 5 are the only three primes less than or equal to 5. 2 is divisible by 24. Then 3 is also divisible by 24. So what does that mean? Since two is not either 24 or one and same with three, that finally means that, that finally means that 24 is composite. Now let's go to a first example. Okay, prove that the 23 is prime. This is pretty straightforward actually. So first we do square root of three, Okay, first we have to do square root of 3, then uh, 23, we find that the ceiling of square, the square root of 23 is 5. So we have to check all the primes less than or equal to 5 once again. 2 is not divisible by 23, 3 is not, 2, two is not, 23 is not divisible by 2, 23 is not divisible by 3 either, and 23 of course is not divisible by five. So what this means that 23 is prime because we checked all the numbers from two to all the numbers less than five that are prime. And since we already proved that we only had to check all the numbers from, from the square root, the ceiling of the square root of the number, therefore that 23 is prime. Okay. Okay. So this is actually not that hard and we'll and if we're only feeling like um, you know all this, um, we are about to get into examples pretty soon. Okay. And then let's go next to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Well, you might already know this, but this is like a, a fundamental theorem, which is you really should know this. We know that all natural numbers can be represented as a product of primes, of course, as we already showed. But the, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic builds off on that idea. So basically, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that every integer has a unique prime factorization up to except for the order of the factors. This allows us to gain more information about the devices. You'll see the importance of this later on. So in other words, this is saying that every integer has a different, distinct, in other words, prime factorization up to the orders of the factors. So we are just saying that the order of the factors doesn't matter. Okay. So for example, 23 has its unique factorization. No other number have, has this factorization, in other words. No other number than 22. Next, let's go to a first example taken from, well, the early AMCs, we can call it the American High School Mathematics Examination. So if 1998 is written as a product of two positive integers whose difference is as small as possible, find that the, what is the difference? Well, let's uh, work on this. So if A, let's say the two numbers are A and B. So then A and B is equal to nine, 1,998. So first uh, we need to find which, how should A and B be so that the difference is as small as possible. That means A needs to be close to B. So we need to minimize the difference from A to B. So basically the absolute value of the difference from A 
to be the difference of A and B needs to be close to zero. So we have to minimize this, minimize. This is a function meaning minimize A minus B. And this numbers are closest to 1998 actually. You can see it for yourself, but we see one factor is going to be under all, for all of this since 1998 is not a perfect square. So for all of this, that's going to be one factor less than square root of 1998, which is 44 to 45 around that. So one factor is going to be less than 44, and then the other factor is going to be greater than 45. You need to find the two factors, factor paths that are closest to 44 and 45. Usually when you're encountered by a problem, it's always best to prime factorize a number like this. So we know that since it's even, it's divisible by two. And then if it's divisible by two, then two times by some division, you can do um, two times 999. 999 times two is 1,998. And then we know that if we divide by this by nine actually, we did nine times 111. And then 100 number can be a tricky number. It looks prime at first, but it's actually divisible by three. Three times 37 is 111. So that means two times three times nine times 37 is equal to 1998. And then since nine is three squared, two times three cubed times 37, is 1998. Okay, 30, note that now 39, 37 is prime. And then 37 is also less than 44. So that means this, if we can multiply this by two, we'll get a number greater than 44, 44. So let's try 37 times two to see that how this might work, but it's not going to actually. So 74, then we have three cubed by itself. If we subtract uh, 27 from 74, we get 37, but um, 47, I'm sorry. So if we get 47, but how are you sure that this is going to be the smallest difference? Because um, we need the difference to be small as possible. And 47, we don't know for sure 47 is the smallest. What if we leave 37 by itself? What if we make 37 the smaller number? If that 37 be a small number, then the bigger number is going to be two times three cubed, which is 54. So 54, as you can see, this is much closer. This has much smaller difference. 54 minus 27 is 17. And then we know that if we even, there's no other way, even if you can try for yourself, but there's no other way to the difference smaller than 17. Because 37 is prime, and we, if we multiply three or two, then we'll get a bigger number and a smaller, that'll be a smaller, small number. And if we subtract the difference, we'll keep getting bigger. So the answer is 17. Okay. Okay, let's try a little harder one. Actually. So that uh, this is an Amy problem. This is one of the earlier and uh, Amy problems by a number one or uh, number two, I think. So find the least positive integer n so that no matter how 10 to the power of n is expressed as product of any two positive integers, at least one of these two integers contain the digit zero. Well, we have 10 to the power of n. Let's just take out the 10 part first. Know that 10 is e 10 to the power of n is equal to two times five to the power of n. Two times five is 10. Okay, so we can write it as this and then by an exponent, Rules, you can also write it as 2n times 5n. So that means that we can say that 2n times 5n, 5, 2 to the power of n times 5 to the power of n is equal to 10 to the power of n. Okay, and then we are supposed to find the least possible integer the n such that at least one of these two integers contain the digit zero. Well, we know that um, in a, in a number, if the, there's a factor of two and there's also another factor of five in any, let's say two, three times two, times five squared, two to the power of three times five squared times seven, the two, if we combine two and five, then we get 10. 
and then you know multiplying by 10 that's always going to be as with one zero or 10 which means that we must split the, the two positive integers one needs to be two to the power of n the other needs to be five to the power of n because if there's one factor of five mixed with another factor of two that's going to be a zero at the end which means which means it'll break this rule so that means so we so we need to keep on trying some values of n. So we know that if we keep on going two to the power of n, so we have to just grind these values out. So we have to try one, try two, and we keep on going. It won't be that long actually, because we know that if we keep on going two, as you most of you remember like the first few powers of two, we can't find any numbers with a zero in it. So let's try five instead. 5 to the power of 1 is 5, 5 to the power of 2 is 25, 5 to the power of 3 is 125, 5 to the power of 4 is 625, 5 to the power of 5 is 3,125. And uh, you'll have three hours on this exam, so it's fine if we bash a little much, little, but if it keeps on going and uh, you can't find any number that works, you should try finding another method. But I'm pretty sure for this problem, this is the so this is the best solution. And we did one five six two five. Okay, we are already at five to the power of six, and then okay, and then also sorry in advance if I make any. Uh, Arithmetic mistakes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I didn't make any here. So that's five to the power of seven. Oh, eight times five is zero. Three hundred ninety thousand eight hundred twenty-five. And what is this? This is five to the power of eight. Five to the power of eight. When five is when five to the power of eight is equal to three hundred ninety thousand six hundred twenty-five, and then two to the power of eight is two hundred fifty-six. Note that there's a zero here, which means eight is the smallest n number value of n such that such that one of these two integers contains a zero. Even if we split apart the two and five factors, you know, if we split apart the two and five factors. If we do five to the power of eight, there's still going to be a zero in the number. And then we know that for any number less than eight, that five won't have any zeros and two won't have any zeros either. So therefore the answer is eight. Okay. Let's go to 2.5. Let's do this problem now. First, let's introduce a combo notation. So basically 200, choose uh, 100, yeah, it's called, uh, when you see brackets like this, it's called 200 choose 100, and this is a combination function. So basically 200 choose 100 is 200 factorial over 100 factorial times 200 minus 100 factorial. So basically we are finding what is the largest two digit prime factor of this. And factorial notation, you know that 200 factorial is equal to 200 times 199 times 198 all the way to uh, down to one. So that means this would have one, the numbers 100 to one. And then this, this would have also the numbers 100 to one. So with that simplification, with that simplification, you can actually, oh, let me move this down. Okay. Maybe the simplification we can write we can write this as two hundred times one ninety nine <clears throat> times one ninety eight all the way to one hundred and one, and then this will be cancelled. Okay, and then we'll have two hundred minus one hundred, another one hundred factorial left. So this is the best for now. We can simplify without having to write all this out. So let's see what the question is. What is the largest two-digit prime factor of this, basically? 
So we need to find the largest two digit prime factor. So we know that 97 is a factor of this. That's going to be one amount, or that's going to be 197 in the denominator. But we also know that 97 times two, 97 times two, is going to be 194. And 194 is go up to here. So that means both factors of 97 are going to be canceled. That means there's going to be no factors of 97 in the resulting number. And we also know that 97 times three is more than 200. So nine, that won't be a 97 times three. And if we can keep on trying for larger primes, we can see that there are no, um, we can see that it's in the numbers. So basically what you're trying to do, sorry, is uh, that we are trying to find for the, small, the biggest two digit prime factor, such that that's gonna be two appearance of this. There's gonna be two appearances of that number in the numerator and only one. Because let's say that we have like 30, 37 times 37 in the numerator, there's gonna be two factors of 37 in the numerator, but there's only gonna be one factor of 37 in the denominator, for example. Then these two will cross out and it'll still be one factor left, as an example. So in other words, we can say of N, let's say of A actually, let's say of A is going to be the largest two digit prime, prime factor. Basically we need three A, so that means the second, the basically the third, the third smallest multiple of uh, A, the third smallest multiple needs to be less than 200. So it can be shown here. So 3a must be less than or equal to 200. Then we also need to find the second multiple. You know, we need to know that the second multiple needs to be greater than 100. So basically if a is, let's say 37, then the second multiple of a, 37 times two is 74 will not work because 74 is not greater than 100. But you might be, and then trivially A is going to be less than 100 since two is greater than equal to 100. So in other words, we can say that, we can say that the second multiple and third multiple are going to appear in the numerator and only the first multiple is going to stay in the denominator. So two multiples in the numerator and one multiple in the denominator. And we already saw that two versus one, the top one is going to stay. So basically we have inequalities, let's just solve them. So A is going to be less than or equal to 200 over three. A is going to be greater than or equal to 50. So therefore, this is around, um, say this is out 66.66 dot dot dot. Okay, so 50 is less than equal to A, which is also less than equal to 66 and two thirds as well. So we need to find the smallest prime, I mean the largest prime. So going down from 66 to two thirds, 66 is composite, 65 is also composite, 64 as well, 63, 62, Okay, 61 works, right? 61 is prime, and it's the small, it's the largest prime down from 66. So if you try 61, 61 is gonna be on the denominator one time, then 61 times two is gonna be on the numerator, and 61 times three is also gonna be on the numerator. So these two cancel out, and there'll still be one so 61 remaining, which is the largest two to the prime factor. Therefore, 61 is the answer. Also, if I have any questions, this might be a little bit confusing at first. This might be a little confusing. So you can ask the TAs in case you have a problem. Okay. So um, now we can take a five minute break as I think I, I think we did a little bit of a tree exercise that and might be a little confusing. So we can take this time to all ask the TAs, I think um, definitely, uh, definitely cool people and they will, they can help you on these questions if you don't understand anything. I think uh, a few of you might be still conflicted on what the, this notation means. So we, we'll take a small break.
Okay, um, I think we can start going to, I think the break's over. So, um, we can, <clears throat> we can start talking about the, we can start talking about the number of devices. Um, if any of you came now, we, we just started the uh, proposed session 3.1. Okay, so let's start say finding how many devices there are. We only talked about whether the number is prime or not, but we never talked about how many devices there are. So basically, if a number n has the prime factorization d sub one, e sub to the power of e sub one, so on, then the number of devices, number of devices n has is you call this, this is a basic function e sub one plus one times e sub two plus one so on e sub k plus one now let's go to uh, let's first show an example and then um let's first go to an example and then i'll say the the proof i'll walk through the proof so let's say we have 24 we know that it's equal to two cubed times three one so then e sub one, this is e sub one, this is e sub two. So e sub one plus one plus e sub two plus one is equal to four times two, and that's eight. And there are eight factors. This means there are eight factors of grade four. Let's list them out. One, two, three, and four, and then that's six. That's six and four, three times eight, two times 12, and one times 24. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight devices. So as we can see, this works. But we can't just say for a number that just because it works, that means it's this is true for everything. So we have to do this thing called proving it. And proving is very important when you're later in um, Olympiads. So it's best to learn proving as um, in a well, Olympiads like the USAMO you'll be asked to prove it until you can't just write the random number down and uh, expect to get points. You have to show you have a proof work. So the proof is any devices of n is equal to p1, we'll just call this, is of the form p, p sub one, a sub one, a sub two, and then, oh wait, we'll also say, this was small typo. This is p sub k to the power of a sub k. For some a sub one, and this is the in function, that means a sub one can be either zero, one, all the way to e one. A sub two is going to be either zero, one, all the way to e sub two, and so on and so forth till a sub k. is can be either zero, it can be either one, it can be either two, it can either be up to e sub k. And let's say why. Why? Because if, uh, if it's going to be a divisor, that means we must know that each exponent is, should be less than or equal to e sub one. If a sub one is going to be greater than e sub one, let's uh, let's take out that case. If it's uh, greater than that, that means like let's say two to the power four, but then now n is equal to two to the power of three, and let's say we have two to the power of four, which is sixteen. This is eight. Sixteen is not a divisor of eight, of course. Eight is the divisor of 16. So this means that if the exponent of one prime is greater than exponent in another in the other prime, then this number is not going to be the divisor. So therefore, a sub one must be less than or equal to e sub one. And we can see this a sub two must be less than e sub two, and then so on. a sub k is going to be less than its respective e sub k, less than or equal to. So it can still be a factor. So that means that total of zero, one, all the way to e sub one. So that means e sub, there's a total of e sub one plus one can be just e sub one because we have to count zero as well. So that means um, that's gonna be e sub one ways to find the divisor for e sub one. And then does the total of e sub one choice e sub one plus one choices for the power of a one. So it can be zero one all the way to e sub one. And then for e sub two plus one choices, because for a two, and then so on for e sub k plus one choices. 
So let's write that again. So a little bit messy. Okay. So once again, E sub one plus one is how many ways that that can be, this power can be. So it can be zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to E sub one. Yeah. And then um, for this, E2, it can be zero, one, all the way to E sub two. And then this, this can be all the way from zero to E sub K. So that means there's a total number of ways as this is common matrix, common matrix. Um, so that's going to be E sub one plus one choices for A1, E sub two, and then so on and so forth. And if we multiply all this by this, like the, it's the fundamental theorem accounting, uh, these are basically independent variables. And if we multiply them, we'll, feed a, we'll see the total number of divisors as you can say that this, we can see that, um, that's going to be this is going to be the total number of uh, divisors for any device of n. So any that's going to be a total of e sub one plus one e sub two times e sub two plus one all the way to e sub k plus one, and that's going to be how many divisors the number n has. And if you're confused, um, you can ask a uh, TA. I think this uses some basic counting principles that, and since it's number theory, we do not we are not covering them. We're not covering uh, counting here much. So if you're confused on why this is true, you can ask for TAs. But basically, we're just multiplying the number of choices for each, each uh, variable. So P1, E2 plus E sub 1, it's going to be, that's going to be E sub 1 plus 1 ways for E sub 1 to work. And then so on for each variable. And if we multiply them, you'll see how many <clears throat> how many divisors there are. Now let's go to 3.2. This is sum of divisors. It's used less common and the proof is a little bit harder here. So we'll leave it as an exercise and then you can always ask us in office hours and we'll be happy to share the solution with you. Also for time constraints because this, this, this is a little bit of a long solution. So basically for now, if n is equal to this notation, this is prime factorization, then the sum of devices n has is one plus p sub one all the way to p sub one to the power of e sub one. Then it'll be one plus p sub two all the way to p sub two to the power of k sub two, and then so on to e sub k. Okay, right, sorry, once again, small question. Okay, so the next, um, let's find an example. So two, three times three, one again. Then for this, this is uh, P sub one, then one plus P sub one plus P sub one squared, P sub one squared, then four, then all the way to P sub one to the power of E sub one, which is eight. And then same for this, one plus P sub two, and then the one is the E sub two, so we don't go any further. Then if we add this up, 15 and then we did one plus three, this is four, and then you get 60. The sum of all the devices of 24 is 60. So basically, so basically that's how you find a sum of the devices. It's basically finding all the powers, including and before E sub one, and then and multiplying them up, like the last one. And uh, as I said, I'll leave that as an exercise and you can always ask to in office hours. Okay, let's see here. What do we have here? Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, it didn't load, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll do this. How many positive? Oh, and this problem we are not doing due to time constraints, but it'll be shown in your handle, and you can, as I said, you can always ask in office hours. So then let's do this problem. How many positive cubes divide three factorial times five factorial times seven factorial? So this is basically three times two times one, seven times zero, five times four times three times two times one. Zoom in a little. 
3 times 2 times 1 times 5 times 4 times 3 all the way to 1. So 7 times 6 times all the way to 1. So that means um, let's first um, prime factorize this actually. So let's find, let's start going to each prime and let's see how many in each factorial there are. So three times two times one, that's gonna be one factor of two. So let's give it a tally, one. And then for here, four has two. Four has two curves of two, since four zero two times two. So one, two, and then there's a two here. So that means that's a total of three. And then for seven, it has six, four, and two that each have a power of two and four has two curves. So two, 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 and then four has an extra power of two. So that means that's an extra of four. So that means there's a total of eight powers of two. And for three, there's one here. There's also one here. And then there's gonna be three. And then there's also gonna be six. Three has one and then six also has one. So that's a total of four. Then we already, we don't need to check four as four is composite and it's already covered in two to the power of eight. So we skip to five, which is prime. Five has one here uh, because it's here and then seven, then there's times six times five. five. Five is also shown here. And then finally we have seven. Seven is only shown here. So this is basically a prime factorization. Now here comes the little confusing part. So basically for a cube, for a cube, each of its, um, each of its uh, exponent in its prime factor, so E1, E2, dot, 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 must be a multiple of three. So must be a multiple of three here, here. So basically for it to be a cube, we need to find a power such that this is going to be, the this is a multiple of three. So this can be either zero because three, you have to know that three times zero is equal to zero. So it can be zero. We can also make this as three. We can also have this power of six, okay? So two to the power of zero is a cube. Two to the power of three is also a cube. And then two to the power of six is a cube. Then how about this? Three to the power of zero is a cube. Three to the power of three is also a cube. Then how about this? Five to the power of zero is a cube, but we don't have five to the power of three since the exponent is only two. And then for the same thing, it can only be seven to the power of zero. It's just, and since one is always the perfect cube. So basically these are the ways such that if we assume that each, uh, this number, is, these are its prime counterparts. For it to be prime in all, then all these exponents must be either zero, three, or six, zero or three. And then for these, it must be zero. So that means basically there are three ways to choose the power of two. There are two ways to choose the power of three. There's one way to choose the power of five. And there's only one way as well for to choose the power of seven. So that means in other words, sorry, that means in other words, there's only three times two times one times two, one ways to find all the devices. These are all the devices, such that the divisor is a perfect cube. So that means there's a total of six, there's just a total of uh, six powers, such that six, I mean, I'm sorry, there's only a total of six devices that are perfect cubes. Okay, so six is the answer. Go to the next one. Let n be the smallest positive integer that is a multiple of 75 and that's exactly 75 positive integral divisors. Find n divided by 75. So n must be equal to 75 times x, right? Because it's multiple by definition. Actually, let's set this as here. n is equal to 75 times a. And then we always prime factorize. So prime factorization will make it really helpful as it says devices. As it says devices. So when you hear the word devices, it's always good to prime factorize. So that's your motivation for 
which were applying factorized to 75. So 75 is equal to 3 times phi squared, and n is equal to 3 times phi squared times a. So now we know that there's going to be exactly 75 possible divisors of n, okay, including one and itself. So of course. So that means that's going to be, it's going to be after multiplying by a. Let's say that this is going to be 3a. Okay, let's do e1, actually. G. V to the power of E1, 5 to the power of E1, E2 actually, I'm sorry. And then we multiply this, or oh, A is going to be used here, and we're trying to make it the smallest. So it's best to just have 3 and 5 in the prime factorization. We can also add 2, but we can do that in the end. For now, let's just assume that it, uh, this number M has only multiples of three and multiples of five, okay? So let's try doing that. So then by the formula, e plus e to the e sub one, e sub one plus one times e sub two plus one is going to equal 75. So now we basically just have to like, find the smallest possible number of, in this form. So that means we have to make E1 greater than E2, because as you can see, the higher, higher number of powers five has, the much bigger the number is going to be compared to how many powers of three has. So three cube, in other words, three cube is less than five cube. So therefore, we need, since we're trying to find the smallest positive number, because uh, we had to make this number greater than two while making both of these as small as possible. So let's try some numbers actually. So um, let's try 15 and five, okay? Yeah, let's try 15 and five. So that means E1 is gonna be 14 and then E2 is gonna be four. But that's um, kind of big, right? 3 to the power of 14 is actually a little bit uh, big. So let's try finding something else. Um, I'll give you a small moment to find it. Okay. Give a second. Sorry, that's uh, something in the background. Uh, sorry about that. So basically, um, basically these things are really big, like 15 and five, that's uh, actually a little bit big. And that's why something else, 25 and three, that's even bigger. Oh, we have somebody in the waiting room. Okay, we press on it. Um, then there's nothing much else actually. This is really big. So when I said earlier, I said we could add the power of two because the power of two is smaller, is the smallest prime available to us. Okay, so we can see that this, let's let, okay, let's let A be a power of two and three and five as well. So we can say two to the power of E1, three, three to the power of E2 times five to the power of E3 is called B N. Then E sub one plus one, E sub two plus one, then E sub three plus one is going to be equal to 75. This looks easier to handle, right? They look, since that's going to be three, three, three different numbers, the numbers can be even smaller. Once again, let's try five, three and five this time, just three times five, 15. three times five, 15. And then once again, we leave the bigger number, we leave the smaller numbers toward the end. So we can do five, five, three. So then respectively, E1 is going to be four, E2 is going to be four, E3 is going to be two, right? So it means two to the power of four, 
3 to the power 4, 5 to the power 2. This could be equal to n. Let's see if that's the smallest though. How do we know it's the smallest? Well, you can see that, see that 4 comma 4 comma 2 is pretty small as well. And then we can also check other types of divisors. So we can try 15, but 15 is the composite. We can always make it 5, 3, and 5. And 25 is a really bad idea to put in. So therefore, 5, 3, and 5 are the smallest possible numbers uh, for E1, E2, and E3. And then what are we supposed to find? N or over 75. So N over 3 times 5 squared. Cancel this out with the 3 cubed. And then 2, 4 times 3 cubed, 16 times 27. And then 7, 162, and then 27. 432 is going to be the answer. Okay. Okay. And then uh, let's see if that's going to be, I want to see how often that's any more clearly. So there's going to be one more, um, this is going to be a last example for today. And uh, this is from the 2017 AMC 12B and this is from the later end. And this has some combo as again. So we will obviously need help, you can obviously ask the other TAs. The number 21 factorial, which is a long number, has over 60,000 positive integer devices. One of them is chosen at random. What is the probability that it's odd? So as always, we find the number of powers of each prime. And let's use this thing called legendaries. I think I pronounced it wrong, but there's this formula called legendaries that make it easy to find the prime factorizations, prime factorization of this of a number. So basically legendaries, Sorry. Oh, Lagrande. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's Lagrande actually. So that's how you pronounce it. So the means Lagrande basically says that let's say we have a prime two, then then the total number of factors, that's the total number of powers of two in the number 21 factorials will be the number, the resultants of 21 divided by two and the floor of it. I'll cover the floor in a minute. And then 21 divided by 2 factorial plus um, 21 divided by 2 to the power of 3 and uh, so on to 21 divided by 2 to the power of n such that 2 to the power of n is going to be less than or equal to 21. So let's cover the floor now. So the floor of like the ceiling we discussed earlier the floor is basically about the opposite of the ceiling. So basically the floor takes the least into the greatest integer less than five point less than the number in these brackets. So that means the least integer, the, the greatest, I'm sorry, the greatest integer less than 5.5 .5 is going to be five. The greatest integer less than 7.5 is going to be seven. And as you can see, there's a reason why they're called floor and ceiling. I think this will make sense. Anyways, getting back to the question. So that's basically what legend just does. And make sure this only works for primes. So if we do per over four, it won't work and you won't get the correct uh, amount of factors. And then you won't get the correct prime factor ratio. So. so let's try three now. 21 by three plus 21 by nine. But three cubed is 27 and 21 is less than 27. So we can only go up to here and we stop. Okay, let's find this first. This is 10, this is five, this is two, and this is one. 10 plus five is 15. So two to the power of 18, two 18. And for this, this is three, I'm sorry. This is gonna be seven and this is gonna be two. So three to the power of nine. And let's go to five. Note that all the composite numbers are covered by these. Six is covered, 12 is covered, and so on. So we don't need to account for them. Then 21 over five, and then five squared is, five squared is by five, so we don't count that. So it only has four 
Okay, seven again, so 21 divided by seven is three and seven squared is way too big for compared to 21. So that means seven cubed, then 11. 11 only has one factor in 21, because 22, I mean, 121 is way too big. Then 13, yeah, that's also going to be one again. Then 17, 19, and then finally, there's no more time. So just a basic uh, factorized change. And this looks a little bit tedious, but it'll let you see in a moment, actually. So now let's go on. One of them is shows at random. We need to find a probability that's odd. When you mean random, and when we have questions like this, they're basically founding the probability, the probability of successful, success, sorry if I spelled it wrong. Um, yeah, I think I wrote it correctly. Success and all possibilities. Okay. So that's basically the probability to chart. Success means what's the probability that chart? This is going to be a success. And we have to find out of all the devices, all div. Okay. I need to zoom in a little more. So basically, we have to find also how many odd devices there are. So basically, you all know this, but if we don't, um, it's basically that all even numbers must have a power of two in the prime factorization because two is even. Two is the smallest even prime and the only even prime as well. So that basically means if a number of, let's use a text box here. It's really small. If, um, number is even and then it has least one power of two. Oh, we are, zero does not count. Well, zero does not have a prime factorization as uh, zero is the prime not opposite. And it has at least one power of two at prime. Uh, factorization. Obviously, obviously, then the number to number at least one power of two. Is even. And then we can also negate this and say that if the positive number does not have at least one power of two in its prime factorization, then the number is odd. Okay. So we, we want the number to be odd, right? So therefore that means there should be no, so there should be no factors of two. So there should be no factors of two here. Okay. So that means we if we find now, this is going to be the important part of the problem, and you have to the, figure this out to enable to be able to solve this. But you can say that if a number is going to be a divisor of this, if a number is a divisor of all this, then the number is going to be odd. Furthermore, if, if we find all the number of divisors of this number, we'll let this equal a we find all the number of devices of A, that's going to be all the odd number devices of this whole number, which is N, okay? And here's the reasoning. So there are no powers of two here, actually. All these numbers are odd. Furthermore, three to a power of nine, A is a divisor, A, A, I mean, A is a factor of, let's call this number, A is a factor of, 21, yeah, 21, I'm oh, sorry, so A is a factor of 21 factorial, which is this number once again. So therefore, if we find all the factors of A, that means the, all these factors of A are going to be factors of 21 factorial, and all those factors are going to be odd. 
So we find all the factors of A, which is five plus one, four plus one, three plus one, plus one, and I will this for four. Out of all, all the factors of to this 21 factorial, which is going to be the same thing, but 18 plus one, nine plus one, four plus one, and dot, dot, dot and these all cancel out. Okay, and then we leave with the one over 18 plus one, and that's going to be one over 19. And let's see. So I correct and so I Yep, I'm correct. Um, so that means uh, I didn't make any any uh, sillies. So that means one over nineteen is going to be an answer for this. For example, three point seven, twenty seventeen AMC twelve B. The answer is going to be one over nineteen. So basically, the motivation for this point is to use the new for. I forgot the pronunciation. I'm sorry. So it's uh, Lagrandes. Yeah. Lagrande. So Lagrande, um, we found it, and this is basically the flow function formula to find all the factors of a prime number in a factorial. We use that, and then we load the whole prime factorization, and then we use this um, we use this idea. If we don't care about all the powers of two, if we don't care about them, how many total per factors are there? And that basically gives us all the odd numbers, and then we they use probability of success and over probability of all possibilities. And then that's how we got the answer. So then I think we are done here for today. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the lesson. And then and then I think we'll post the handout a bit soon. And that's gonna be like one more example we weren't able to cover due to time strains. And um, that's also be a problem set for you to finish. And once again, you can always chat, or chat with us in office hours and we'll be happy to help. Thank you for coming to today's class. And I'm sorry if I made a mis any mistakes, which is probably a lot, but if you want, again, you can always see the recording, which we'll post into a, which we will post. Okay. So you stop screen sharing. Yeah, go ahead. I stopped the recording.